I'm very excited to talk to you about this subject today. This is something I've now been working on uh, for uh, most of my career now in uh, melanoma medical oncology. To give you some background about myself, uh, and just and a disclaimer, I'm an Oregonian. <laughs> I was uh, born in Portland, but uh, for my uh, medical training, I moved to Utah. And um, Utah is a state where uh, there are a lot of fair-skinned people living at a very high elevation. So our incidence in Utah uh, of melanoma was extraordinarily high. Uh, and it was there that uh, I really uh, grew up as a melanoma oncologist. Uh, I did practice in the years before the newer drugs uh, were available. And now I'm so excited to be living in a time when um, we've got some tools that I think actually cure patients, which is uh, wonderful, even with the most advanced data stages of the disease. Adjuvant therapy is something different. So um, uh, for those of you not familiar, um, uh, once a surgeon has done their best to remove cancer, it is not a 100% guarantee that it won't come back. And there are a variety of reasons why that might be, which I'll share with you here in a moment. But I really believe that this may be the best opportunity for us to cure someone with melanoma because at that time, after the surgeon has done their level best to get it, all the cancer, what remains is very small volume. We can't see it on a scan. Uh, and it's, it's those little spots that may be actually very vulnerable to our therapies. And we're starting to learn just how powerful this tool can be. Uh, I'm going to take questions at the end just to stay on time, so I want you to remember. <laughs> I, I like the audience participation, but I'm going to keep rolling here for a little while. What is that? I'll get there. Uh, yeah, and, and I would like, I, I like the engagement, but I want to save questions for the end so we can, we can stay on pace here, and uh, I, I will do my best to answer them uh, follow. So this slide uh, I prepared in 2011, and it was data taken from uh, a national database called the SEER database. At that time, our melanoma incident, incidence was 18 out of every 100,000 people. That has gone up a little since that time. Uh, and there were right around 8,000 deaths in the US annually. That number was steadily climbing until about two years ago, and you saw Dr. Chen's slide, which showed it well above 9,000, and I'm hopeful to see it come down, actually, below that figure here in, in just a few short years. So we're really at the, at the front end of seeing a major uh, uh, impact on the actual survivorship of the disease. Well, as you learned about staging, being in a low-stage patient is better, and for those who have stage 1 and stage 2 disease, uh, we would estimate that maybe as many as 90 to 95 percent of those patients are actually cured by surgery, and they would not necessarily need a, a treatment. The stage 3 patients, those that have a positive node, have a much higher risk of relapse, and so that's the population at large uh, that I see to talk about adjuvant therapy. The stage four patient uh, now is treated primarily with systemic drugs, and historically, this is an old slide again, historically, about 90% might not even make it two years. Uh, that number has come down dramatically, and now I would say that we're perhaps even curing as many as 60 to 70% of patients who present with stage four disease. Just pause and think about that for a moment. That's almost a tenfold improvement in overall life expectancy in stage four cancer over about a decade. And we're, I think, just only gonna get better from here. So to understand adjuvant, which is the question uh, you asked just a moment ago, uh, it's important to understand the enemy, which is the melanoma cell. Where do they come from? Why are they so hard to kill? Uh, these are really fundamental questions that we've been trying to answer in the lab for years, and I'll give you some uh, uh, just general concepts of that. But for treating with adjuvant, this is, again, we have a patient, probably cured by surgery, that may have a few little tiny micrometastatic deposits that are waiting to grow up. And so with adjuvant, our goal is the complete eradication of all of those micromets. A kind of crude metaphor that I like to use is it's a little like putting weed and feed on your yard, right? Imagine there's a little dandelion in the corner of the yard and it's blown its seeds out there in the grass. 
You can't see where those seeds are, but you know they're there statistically. And so if you treat with that weed and feed, you'll get those seeds before they even grow up to become a dandelion. Well, why is melanoma spread at the time of surgery? And, and my, from my point of view, this gets back to its uh, origins actually as we develop from uh, embryonic beings, right? So when we are uh, uh, conceived and we're going through all of this development before we're born, the, uh, there are many different layers of folding of cells and differentiation of those cells that occur. This little green area, and hopefully you can see my pointer right there, is the source of melanocytes. And those are the pigment cells that are in our skin that give us the suntan. Well, during that course of development, they do something that's very unique. Not very many other cells can do this. They fold and fold and fold, and then when they get to this point of development, they actually crawl through and swim out to distant sites. And so it's that ability to break free of their foundation, to swim through other tissues, and then to colonize a new place that's very important for their natural uh, history that makes them quite dangerous because when they forget what they're supposed to be doing in the skin and they start to become a cancer, well, they go back into swim mode <laughs> and they can go and they can spread to other places. So that brings us to this point. And we don't know this answer for sure, but we've tried to speculate exactly for those patients who ultimately do relapse, how many cancer cells are left in their bodies after a surgery? Well, as it turns out, if you try and do the math and you go from the size of the tumor that presents when that patient has their relapse back to their surgery time, you can calculate that there may be as many as a million cancer cells left in a very high-risk patient after that surgery. And again, these are only the relapsers. About half of them are fully cured, but there is a half that may become a relapser, and, it, and it's those patients that absolutely need adjuvant therapy. So where is this disease distributed? There are two ways this cancer can come back. One is in the area of the surgery, which is actually less common than relapses distantly. Uh, and distant sites, just to give you some idea, uh, are evenly spread to multiple different uh, tissues, lung, liver, brain, bone, sometimes the GI tract. And it's, from my point of view, that those relapses, those events, obviously are quite scary to patients, and there's something that we really want to prevent. So even if we couldn't cure a patient of melanoma, preventing a relapse, for example, in the brain is a big deal, right? So how do we do that? Well, this gets back to a lot of work. This is decades of work that I'm presenting to you distilled on one slide. Um, many of these trials, including uh, S0008, were conducted when Dr. Sondak was the lead of the Southwest Oncology Group. So over those years, we showed that actually some immunotherapy could prevent those relapses. They could delay them. Uh, but it wasn't until more recently when these contemporary trials, shown in red here, we really started to move that needle forward. And now we have uh, some incredibly active drugs that I'm going to share with you here in a moment. Our work is not done, so we have actually ongoing, uh, fully accrued, meaning the last patient has entered the trial, and we are just awaiting the results of these with uh, eager anticipation of different drug combinations compared to standards. This one here is the one that I'm leading. I uh, have been the PI of SWOC 1404 uh, since its inception, and we're hopeful that will report out sometime this fall. So what kind of improvements do we see with these new drugs? And there's a lot to unpack here, so I'm going to try and go through each panel separately to explain what it all means. First of all, this is relapse free survival. And when we look at one of these curves, these are something that uh, everyone in medicine pays a lot of attention to. They're called Kaplan-Meier curves. Uh, and to walk you through, on this axis, uh, these are the number of patients who at the beginning of the trial have no evidence of cancer. So if you start here, there's no cancer. Each time a patient relapses, the line drops down. So you can see that over time, about half the patients with stage 3 disease, treated with ipilimumab, uh, may experience a relapse event by five years. 
That's still a, big, a very sobering number. This is a trial that was controlled with a placebo. And um, a lot of patients, when they talk about clinical research, get understandably very nervous when we say, gosh, we're going to put you on a placebo. Uh, in this era, when this trial was conducted, we were so uncertain about exactly the right drug to use for this cancer that a placebo was the only reasonable option to pick for this particular trial. And lo and behold, it was positive. It, it improved the relapse-free uh, survival by about 10% in five years. And, and it's this separation that we see in curves that that's what, that's what we like to see in any kind of clinical trial. That means the results are positive. Well, this trial, uh, uh, ultimately led to the approval of ipilimumab for adjuvant melanoma some years ago. And uh, we've now had several others report recently. This one uh, is comparing targeted therapy, which you'll hear more about from Dr. Araglu, who is uh, uh, getting warmed up over there in the bullpen. Uh, so targeted therapy is a little different than immune therapy. It, it really goes at the uh, molecular underpinning of what's causing that cancer cell to divide. Well, as it turns out, it can work pretty well in adjuvant therapy. You can see there's a big difference between the placebo arm here and the treatment arm up here. The other trials that have reported recently, this one's taking a ipilimumab, which became the standard, and comparing it to nivolumab, which is a new kind of immune therapy. We're moving the bar up even higher. And then this is the trial that Dr. Sondak was mentioning just a few moments ago, data presented in Chicago uh, just a few days ago. And we're seeing that uh, pembrolizumab, another PD-1 inhibitor, can work just about as well as nivolumab. So um, we're really seeing some terrific advances forward in terms of preventing relapse. Well, what does that lead mean for life expectancy? And that's the biggest question that any patient who comes to see me wants to know is, will this treatment make me live longer? These trials are designed to answer that question, but they take a very long time to read out, sometimes as long as 10 years from the start of that trial to the ultimate confidence that we're moving the needle up in terms of overall survival. But it does appear that at least two of these trials that have reported uh, recently are improving overall survival for the stage three population by about 10%. So we're seeing some nice steady gains in moving the needle up. These two down here have not yet reported and we're hopeful soon to see results from those. This is just a brief introduction to the work that I'm doing. Uh, and um, it takes a tribe to do these. <laughs> so there's lots of collaborators on this. Dr. Sondak wrote much of the surgery aspects of this protocol. Uh, we have terrific support from biomedical statisticians who uh, do the math. As, as doctors aren't always so good at math, I'll confess. Uh, but we've got folks that are really good at that. Uh, so it really does take a tribe. And this trial is a randomized trial. And, and where we designed it, we were trying to get down to uh, a relatively, uh, I would say, medium risk 3A. So that's kind of like where we draw the line and saying, Okay, that's a patient that probably has enough relapse risk to uh, uh, accept some of the toxicity of these drugs. And they're not benign. There are some very significant side effects you'll hear about in the next talk that you have to consider when you're giving a patient uh, treatment. It's a big study. Uh, it takes almost 14,000 patients to get the data, I, I'm sorry, uh, 1,400 patients to get the data for uh, research like this. Um, but fortunately, uh, in this day and age, patients are, are very generous with their participation in this kind of work. Uh, and we were able to complete this trial actually a year ahead, ahead of schedule. We put the last patients on uh, August last year. And it takes a lot of different sites as well. So um, Moffitt I'm highlighting here. Uh, this center was actually the leading center in terms of the accrual to the trial, so many patients from Florida contributed. Uh, and uh, nationally, we had great uptake. Sam. Oh, thank you. That's my five-minute warning? Excellent. Okay, I should, I should stay on time here. Um, we also had contributors from Ireland and Canada, so we extended uh, internationally as well. 
Um, our first analysis of this data will be happening this summer, so uh, what we're in the process of doing is collecting all of the case report forms that those patients generated and sitting down and making sure that we have uh, properly coded, collected, staged uh, all of the patients that have entered so our reports are accurate at the end. So if I have my dream, uh, we'll get to present this uh, this fall in Munich. Uh, there's a European Society of Medical Oncology meeting coming up. Um, and we have several other things that will be uh, learned from the patient data. Not the least of which is quality of life. So we've talked about the hard metrics, right? What does it mean to eliminate relapse? What does it mean to improve life expectancy? Those are easy to measure. But from a patient point of view, uh, how do they feel as a result of this treatment? Are the side effects bad enough that it's actually making them miserable for a small gain? Uh, or is the uh, benefit that they're receiving in terms of that relapse-free uh, uh, survival uh, worth the toxicity and risk associated with those drugs? And that's what quality of life metrics are all about. We also hope to learn uh, who to identify for treatment. So uh, one of the things that we have lacked for many years is a tool that says, okay, <laughs> that's the patient that needs adjuvant therapy. But this patient may actually be cured of surgery. And if we had just the right test, perhaps uh, something Dr. Chen could do with that tumor that she, she took out that could tell us that, we could make much better decisions for our patients. And then finally, we have collected uh, as much of the imaging associated with these patients. They all had to have scans every three months on the trial. So we now have banked uh, thousands of digital images from every patient so we can learn possibly how we could even detect the cancer's relapse sooner with those tools. So for today, I want to remind you that for most patients with stage 3 resected melanoma, they should talk to an oncologist about adjuvant therapy. With no treatment, the relapse risk in that population is high, perhaps as high as 50 to 70 percent over five years. But with adjuvant treatment, we're improving those numbers by probably 10 to 20 percent in most patients, and we are making them live longer, which is something that is uh, terrifically exciting to all of us today. I'll leave my acknowledgement slide up, uh, and, and uh, actually I'll point out a few things. Um, I've just had a, a long uh, working relationship with Amit Melanoma, and uh, Sam's mom, Val Gill, needs a uh, particular shout out. I hope she's listening. Um, but Val was very involved uh, from the very beginning of the uh, conceptualization and design of this trial. We, we need patient advocates and organizations like AIM to really uh, be sensitive to how the patients uh, look at our research, and that's how she advises us uh, in its conduct. Um, we have uh, multiple other partners here. Um, Dr. Karoglu, who you're going to hear from here in a few moments, uh, is doing a lot of work on this particular trial. Uh, and I, I want to just tell her thanks in advance for uh, the many hours that are ahead of us together to get this thing wrapped up. 